With a title like this, you're expecting something really great next, I think. But we're going to start here with the plastic bag, a thing of progress. Widespread since the 1970s, when they were introduced, plastic bags were seen as better than the paper bags that they replaced. Cheaper, lighter, more sustainable, they used less material to make, and fewer trees are cut down to make plastic bags than paper bags. They're environmentally friendly. So we used a trillion of them worldwide in 2001. Plastic bags are not really disposable, as we know, yet we use them every day, just like these plastic water bottles. I just brought one on stage with me. Americans drank 34.4 billion liters of bottled water in 2011, and that was 4% more than in 2010. Now, plastic bottles are safer than glass. They're lighter, so they use less carbon to transport them. They're better, but are they? Really, we solved the problem of convenient drinking water, but made a massive new problem of waste. And yet we still use them every day. The incandescent light bulb, replaced by something better. The energy-saving light bulb uses less energy, it lasts for longer, but while we threw the old ones out, these ones have to be recycled to avoid mercury pollution. Recycling uses a lot of energy, many people don't recycle. Is this better? Well, it's complicated, but the plastic bag, the plastic bottle, and the energy-saving light bulb are all common examples of how design and technology can take a problem and solve it and give us more problems in the process, all in the name of progress. We, take, we assume that design and technology make things better. But what do we mean by better? Cheaper, longer-lasting, more sustainable, more pleasurable, profitable, high-tech, Better for whom? And whose better ultimately shapes our common future? Now, a wise man once said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. And yet we keep on doing the same things over and over again with the design. Problem solving. Now, engineering is about problem solving, but I believe that design is different. Design is about possibility. Life as it could be it makes new things out of existing materials. Yet designers want to call themselves problem solvers. I think that we need to do much more than just solve the problems that other people bring to us as designers. I believe we need to challenge those problems and ask different, more relevant questions. Instead of perpetuating systems that we know to be unsustainable, can we use design to, can we get back to this idea that design can actually alter our future? So this is what I'm doing in my practice in, uh, in emerging technologies, collaborating across disciplines to ask, what are we making? Why are we making it? Instead of just using design to make. I believe this is where better innovation may lie, by actually working upstream in emerging technologies. And so I'll explain a bit about synthetic biology, a technology that I've been working in, and some of the projects that I think open up new ways of thinking, and some of the collaborations that I think hint at new ways of working. So this is a plate of E. coli bacteria engineered by undergrads for something called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, or iGEM, nearly a decade ago. They go dark when they're exposed to light, like photographic film, and they called this project E. coloroid, because as you'll see, every project like this needs a snappy pun as a title. And this is an early example of something called synthetic biology, which is essentially a new approach to genetic engineering. The aim is to transform biology and life with it into a 21st century material for design and engineering, aiming to make biology standardizable, predictable, repeatable. Now, biology um, does some stuff differently. It lives and it dies and it reproduces, uh, which is a little unhelpful if you were trying to make it do this, like put it under a system of digital logic. And that's the challenge, well, one of the challenges for synthetic biologists. But what's being promised is a technology that could change the world and solve our problems and make the world a better place through new materials and new kinds of energy sources and medicines and food. Is this a design discipline for the future? Well, perhaps, and that's a completely different talk. But what's, um, you know, what's happening now is something that I find quite alarming. We're making the same things that well, we already have. So fuel for jet planes, rubber for tires, non-biodegradable plastics for products. This is the same thing that we already have. And what's, meant to, well, what's promising to be a disruptive technology 
is actually also promising to disrupt nothing. So as an emerging technology, I think it's a really interesting place where there's little precedent or role for what design is to actually get in there and ask, as it's being shaped, what does it mean to design better? So let me tell you about one project where we, we did this. So back in 2009, uh, seven undergraduates from Cambridge University entered the iGEM competition by designing bacteria to produce a colored spectrum. So these are actually the products of bacteria. And working with another designer, James King, we, we wanted to think about how, what kind of impact this might have on users and services and laws across the coming century, just a simple student project. We wanted to bring these social implications into the, into the engineering design process so the applications and implications were inseparable. So I'll give you just one example from this project. We asked what happens around 2039 if it finally became culturally acceptable to drink engineered E. chromi bacteria in a kind of yogurt drink. You drink this thing, it would be engineered to detect the chemical markers of different kinds of diseases in your gut. And if it detected a disease, well, it would start producing the corresponding colored output, prompting, as I'm sure you're gonna guess what comes next, a visit to the doctor. So we actually mocked up this, um, this suitcase, we called it the Scatalog, and took it with us off to iGEM to ask the scientists making synthetic biology about the way that they're portray portraying this technology as machines, life as machines like this. And we were saying, well, no, but biology is messy, and it's complex, and it's ultimately biological. And if this isn't the future that we want, then what is? Now, synthetic biology, is going to be, if it, if it comes to pass, its impact will be scientific and economic and industrial. But it'll be more than that. It'll be political and ecological and ethical and above all, personal. So this is the tree of life and we're down here with plants and animals. And it's just a human designed object that we use to make sense of the, the complexity of the living world around us. And as I was learning more about synthetic biology, I began to wonder where would these new organisms actually be Classified, this thing is constantly changing according to scientific kind of discourse. Perhaps we're just going to need to add an extra branch. So, as a design student, I added one. This is the synthetic kingdom, just a, an engineering solution to an engineering problem. Maybe it's just part of our new nature. But it's a fiction, of course. But it's a really useful fiction. So it's ended up places like this. This is the first textbook of synthetic biology, or this journal cover. It's enabled me to have these incredible conversations with scientists who are willing to suspend their disbelief to talk about a fiction and say, well, where will we classify these things? Are these things different to what's come before? I mean, for this, I was on the phone to a Nobel Prize winning scientist who was like, Daisy, uh, you could just like, move a couple of things and make it more accurate. Like, what? <laughs> But anyway, uh, others have said, well, Daisy, actually, maybe it's more like little leaves on the different branches, or we're never going to, synthetic biologists will never make so much stuff that so should be smaller. Or maybe this is Drew Endy at Stanford, who's one of the founders of the field. He's like, it's a big kingdom. Um, or maybe it's more like spaghetti. I don't know which one it is, but what it is definitely is a really useful tool to say, is this different or not? Some people have said, well, you've given synthetic biology a kingdom of its own. You're further separating you know, the, what we make from who we are. And I disagree. I think it actually makes that connection stronger. It puts our designs back into nature. And if we can acknowledge that connection between what we make and who we are, will we design better? So this is a, a question that, and this kind of thinking that Took, went into this project, Synthetic Aesthetics. So I'll end by describing this much bigger research project that's been running since 2010, where we took these kinds of questions to the heart of synthetic biology. We paired six artisan designers with six synthetic biologists in residencies and labs and studios, and we asked them to consider some unusual questions. Can you design nature? How do you design nature? And how might you design nature well? So I'll just tell you briefly about three of the projects. We paired an architect with a plant scientist from Cambridge, and you'd think they wouldn't have much in common between their ways of working, but it turned out there was a lot of common kind of technique. And they wanted to look at the idea of the biological computer, which is at the heart of synthetic biology, something made out of DNA that you can program. Instead, they said, well, can't we look at what biology already computes? These are xylem cells from an artichoke, and they make these incredibly complex interfaces. And they wanted to harness this logic, so they worked with uh, computer scientists to actually find a way to 
to harness the, those kind of calculations and make a program or an algorithm that they could then apply to other problems to solve them. And what they've done is actually challenged a fundamental sort of value in synthetic biology that and here instead the whole cell is a computer rather than the DNA and it opens up new ways for working between architecture, materials and synthetic biology. A second project was pairing two designers from IDEO with, with cell biologists and they wanted to look at the scientific design process. Now two things were interesting for me came out of this. The first is that suddenly there was this realization that science has kind of told us this straight story. We did this and we did this and we got these results. But the reality is much more like design. It's messy, it's a creative process. And it's hiding that actually damaging to the way we perceive science and innovation in science. The second thing I found really interesting was to watch was the designers kind of maybe believed the hype around synthetic biology, that they were going to be able to go into the lab and engineer some stuff, but this future is not here yet. So this is one of the design fictions that they came up with, which out of the workshops where they imagined a cup and the future that would be grown. But it points to really interesting collaboration between design, commercial design and science. And for me, it kind of hints at, at discussions that need to happen around the instrumentalization of nature. So this, as you remember, the Hello World plate, the, the designers then put their logo in the same format. And finally, we paired a, um, a smell provocateur, yes, that's a profession, with a, a biologist. And they wanted to investigate what they see as the cultural conflict and, and fear that we have of biology. We live in a world where we, ba and we pasteurize and, and sanitize everything, and this is a future that's being promised, powered by synthetic biology. But actually, we're outnumbered by bacteria. Our bodies are 10 to 1 bacteria to our own human cells, and we're increasingly understanding how much we rely on them to live. So they wanted to kind of highlight this issue. And also, you know, bacteria, they're everywhere. I don't know if anyone's ever smelt a Limburger cheese. It smells like feet, because it's very similar bacteria that are on your feet that are in the cheese. So, um, and you know, cheese is made like this, with hands and bacteria get in it. So they decided to do the obvious thing, which is to make human cheese. Uh, yes, my armpit. Um, I have now shown this around the world, and uh, your disgust tells me something, which is that you see this as biology out of context. Context is everything. The designed objects that we make, they operate in a wider social, political, ethical, and ecological context than just the objects themselves. And human cheese reminds us that things can't operate in isolation. Everything comes with a bigger story attached. So if you actually want to smell these, they'll be in the Grow Your Own show at Science Gallery Dublin next month. Um, I think there's some fresh daisy armpit has been made. Um, so, what's so important about this project, though, is that it was funded by science and engineering, by the NSF and the EPSRC, and so that those conversations are constantly going straight back into science, as well as the arts and design and policy discussions. And all of this has been kind of explored in our book that's coming out um, in, in March, co-written by the 20 participants of this project. So I've talked about how I think, to, as designers, uh, we need to kind of fundamentally challenge the very nature of what we, as a, as society, thought were the problems. And I ask, rather than perpetuate the present, can we use design to actually shape our future? Can we use design to help identify and, and kind of build alternative ideals? Because ultimately, I believe that if we ask better questions, we'll have better problems to solve. Thank you.